Good morning, Hickory. How's everybody doing? Great. I'm going to extend what Stephen Horan was talking about in terms of movement, and I'm going to be talking more about the gazelles and the lions. In particular, I'm going to talk about birds and what birds can teach us about energy, and also what birds can maybe teach us something about faith. Now, when I was uh, in elementary school, in fifth grade, I had two best friends, Paul Dragunas and Alex Wade. They weren't in my class. They were in Mr. Kessner's class. But of course, I had to do everything that they were doing. And what Mr. Kessner had them do was to learn the local birds in our community. So when we weren't sneaking out to the copper kettle at lunchtime going through the fence, in the afternoons, we were actually bird watching. They had flashcards, and it was really a fun thing to do. And my father encouraged this. We used to go down to Leeds Pond. This was in Port Washington, New York. And look at some of the birds that were showing up in July or August. And uh, here's one of the species, a great egret. And I realized after I went to college that I actually, actually could study these birds in graduate school and make somewhat of a career of, uh, of studying them. And they're the two species, the great egret and the snowy egret. And these birds were almost decimated um, in the United States at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s because of the millinery trade. The millinery trade is the women's hat industry at the time. And uh, the word egret is actually is named for the plume that comes out of their bodies during the breeding season. And these go very well into women's hats. So people would go into breeding colonies while chicks were being raised and eggs were on nests, etc., and they would just go in with a shotgun and just blow them away. And so the, the birds almost became extinct, and it was actually kind of the carnage that came from this activity that not only started the Lacey Act, which made it illegal to transport these plumes across state lines, but also the National Audubon Society began as a result of protecting these birds. So I had chosen a group of birds that actually sort of had a history uh, in the United States. Today, if you search on Google under, say, the word wetlands, you almost invariably see an egret. So they have become emblematic of wetlands and of conservation. Fast forward from the 19, early 1900s to 1970 to New York Harbor. Uh, this is close to where I grew up. This is actually a picture of the Arthur Kill, which is a waterway. Kill is a Dutch word for creek. Um, and this is a waterway that separates Staten Island, New York, from New Jersey. And if you've ever driven down this part of the New Jersey Turnpike, you know that it's filled with refineries and Superfund sites and places that you generally hold your nose to. But interestingly enough, in the uh, late 1970s, these magnificent egrets began um, colonizing the area and started breeding here. And we tried to understand why this was happening. So I was working for the Manomet Bird Observatory with Kathy Parsons and Alan Macaron, and we were trying to understand how these birds could actually survive in such a toxic area. This is Alan standing next to Prawls Creek. He's standing on a plank. If he wasn't, he'd be up to his ribs in deep, dark mud. Um, he's holding a net on his shoulder. We were actually paid to go fishing at this time in our career, which was a lot of fun. Um, but this was an area of oil refineries and derelict boat yards and power plants and Superfund sites. And the birds continue to nest in that area to this day. So even though there was a toxic load, um, the sewage treatment that actually had been implemented in the 60s and 70s had actually cleaned the water considerably. So they're still breeding there today. So we had this wonderful juxtaposition of industry and these magnificent looking birds. So since that time, we've really been more interested in energy. Uh, we all have to make ends meet in our lives. Corporations have to make ends meet. Businesses have to make ends meet. Can we learn anything from birds from how they make ends meet? And uh, the wonderful thing about studying energy is that it's universal. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the city of Hickory or New York City, an earthworm or a, uh, an egret. They all use matter, they all use energy, and they all have lessons to teach us. Um, the units that we use are things like joules or kilocalories, and if we want to look at energy transfer over time, we're talking about watts. You all have electric bills, so you know about those. 
And the, the really fun part about this is you can compare what seem like apples and oranges, but from an energetic perspective, they're really, it's all the same thing. So a Big Mac, 540 kilocalories or food calories, as you would know, can be compared to Times Square. One square foot of Times Square has the energy of one Big Mac passing through it every day. So stack up those Big Macs and you can see cities are huge consumers of energy. So how about energetics for birds? Well, we know that these birds are relying on marshes. Marshes are powered by the sun, and uh, those marshes make fish, and the birds eat the fish, and of course birds have to poop, and that poop then of course goes back and refertilizes the marsh, or at least a lot of it does, and then of course there's some waste material as well associated with that. So now, I want you to be thinking about watts. When you think about watts, you think about your electric bill or a bulb. But you can think about watts for how much energy you use when you go out running, from Steve's talk, or how, much, how many watts, every, every one of you is, is running at a particular wattage rate right now. So how about our birds? Well, a flying snowy egret um, operates at about 23 watts. A snowy egret that's walking around looking for food is operating at roughly 1 20th of a watt. And watts not only go out, but they come in too, so you have to take in watts, if, and that's in the form of food. So on average, snowy egrets are only taking in about 16 watts. Now this varies from place to place. If there are more fish, then they're taking more watts in, but they have a tendency of sort of running in a deficit. Great egrets, even though they're tw more than twice the size of snowy egrets, also operated about 23 watts. So you might think a little bit more about snowies than maybe not being so efficient. Um, an ambulating great egret is roughly almost a tenth of a watt. Uh, here's the big difference. Uh, they're 50 watts when they take their energy in. So uh, this gives us some insight we're looking at day-to-day -day energy usages and seeing if we can learn something about the longer-term manifestations of using energy that way. So snowy egrets, even though their populations are okay, tend to operate in the red if they don't have enough food, whereas great egrets tend to operate in the black. So these birds have actually been a really interesting instructor for us in learning about energy. And when you look out over the long term, the day-to-day -day energy expenditures of the birds actually have manifestations for local activity. So we know from population studies that snowy egrets tend to sometimes locally have crashing populations. They don't do well every now and then. And we think now that that's because of how they use energy, probably using it too fast. Whereas great egrets tend to have more stability. And again, we think that this comes from how they use energy. Now, everywhere where I've used the word egret, I want you now to think about a corporation, or I want you to think about a city, because remember, energy is the great common denominator. Who has taken the lesson from wildlife and from ecology and actually put it into corporate practice? Here's one fellow. Ray Anderson, the late Ray Anderson, fascinating guy, came to Hickory about five or six years ago to talk here. He was an engineer. He is a self-proclaimed pillager of the earth. He was in the carpet industry, and carpet is highly petroleum intensive. And then he did a radical thing. He started reading ecology textbooks. And being a scientist, he was able to absorb this completely changed his corporate structure, all the way down from the size of pipes to having people go out into nature and study color patterns in nature and bringing them inside. He not only became more profitable, but he became a real beautiful example of how we can learn from energy that, we, that I study with, with birds, but it could be almost anything. This has really taken hold. There is a group out in Montana um, uh, Janine Benyus, who is a, uh, a real 
oftentimes contributor to TED Talks has done a number of these things, and they call it biomimicry. Biomimicry is learning how to do human things, whether it's designing products or running corporations, being inspired by nature, because nature has been doing these things for quite some time. How does our, how does our system work? How does our economy work? Can we learn anything from, from what I've been talking about? This is basically our production system. We have raw materials, we have energy. Energy always goes one way. It goes from useful energy to unuseful energy. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Matter in ecosystems always goes round and round. Well, what we do is we take raw materials, they go to factories, factories produce products, we pay for them, but they're really just designed to be thrown away. So rather than circling around, our matter just goes into a, into a big waste pile, whether it's in the earth or in the air or in our water. So the problem here is that matter is flowing one way, whereas in ecosystems it really circles around. And I think it would be a fantastic idea for any serious business school or corporation to have a professional ecologist who's trained in energy to be on staff. I could just see the, the seminars every Friday afternoon. You're, you know, making whatever it is you make, and then your ecologist comes and talks to you about the energetics of termite mounds. I just think it would be a great way to get people thinking different ways. New ideas bring in new ways of doing things. Um, every organism that's out there is an economy onto itself, whether it's a wasp or a bacteria or a tuna fish. And I also, now that I have this soapbox of TED, um, can also say that I think that anyone going into engineering or business should take at least one course in ecosystem energetics. It's the way energy and matter have been managed for three and a half billion years. I think we can learn from that. It's been making widgets, it's been making services for a long, long time, so I think there are some really valuable lessons for us. This is how production happens in nature, and it's been happening this way for a long, long time. Can we remodel the way we run our economies? Absolutely. In a few moments, Barry Edwards is going to come up here and talk to you about the eco-complex. He and his group are actually putting together this concept that our economy should function like an ecosystem. So products should be rethought and redesigned to be reused rather to be designed to just go into, into the trash heap. And the waste material from one factory can be the raw material for another factory. That's actually how it works. You'd be, and companies would be saving huge amounts of money by doing this. And, I, and I'm, I'm really excited about you hearing Barry's talk in a little while. Since this is the way we've been doing things in these linear fashions, we need to also think about how we teach things. In science, we operate under the reductionistic model. That is to say, to understand something, you have to break it down into parts and understand those parts. That's valuable. It's given rise to biotechnology. It's given rise to nanotechnology. Wonderful things, but it also has its limits because it keeps us from looking at systems, and it also isolates us from other disciplines. So yes, it's important to learn the ABCs of biology, physics, chemistry, business, economics, but soon after you get the basics, we have to break down the silos because the silos are what limit our ability to think outside the box and to come up with novel, prob novel, novel solutions to novel problems. The Earth is facing problems that have never been encountered before, and this is a real challenge for us. Now, I look at all of these things, and I look at what is it that motivates our movement? What, it, what is it that motivates energy? All these different things. And throughout this time in my scientific career, I've also been going through somewhat of a spiritual development. And I do believe that the prime mover is God. And for a long time, I struggled to reconcile my science with my spiritual and my faith belief. Until I read um, at the very end of the book of John, which says that Jesus did many other things, Jesus being there from the very beginning of creation. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room 
for the books that would be written. So there's written scripture, which obviously is a source of wisdom and inspiration, but then there are all the other books that God made. The book of egrets, the book of bees, the book of bacteria, and the book of oak trees. And this was a justification that, yes, you can be a scientist and not have to choose between uh, faith and science. Don't let anybody, if you're an aspiring scientist out there, don't let anybody tell you you have to make a choice. You can blend them really, really beautifully. And the wonderful thing about the way the world is made is that all the different species are cross-referenced through DNA and have been influenced by evolution. So they're all connected even though they're all separate at the same time. The Bible is even clearer than that as to what we are to do with this. That's great for me because I'm a scientist. I like to study egrets. I think they can teach us about a lot of different things. But it's more specific than that. It tells us to go to the ant and consider its ways and be wise. So all those books are there as a source of wisdom as well. I love the quote from Job, but ask the birds, that's all I've been doing. Ask the birds of the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you. How do you speak to a bird? How do you speak to the earth? It's called the scientific method. Of course, you can do it through poetry, um, but scientists ask questions every day. The earth doesn't talk back. You have to actually go out and do science. But then you get answers back, and that's the earth speaking. So again, there's a wonderful blend of science and scripture. Um, so I want to thank Mr. Kessner, who was the teacher of Alex and Paul in fifth grade, because that started a journey for me to learn about birds. And birds have taught me not only about society and, and can be an inspiration for how companies work, but it's also been a, a real spiritual journey for me as well, and I hope that you take it as, as well. Thank you.